John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Why, my hour has not yet come. My mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said, to, he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the ferrier you have kept the good wine until now. Father, I thank you for your holy, written, and anointed word. I thank you for the power that's in your word. I thank you for the truth that is in your word. I thank you, God, that you have granted us life even as we read your word. I thank you for the impartation of life as your word goes forth today. I pray for your insight and wisdom and guidance, God. In the name of Jesus, say this with me. I'm a believer, and I'm a receiver. I received the life of God through the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. This is an awesome scripture that I just read through, and many times we, there's all kinds of things that we can see in it, but this morning... I want to reiterate a few things that I said last week about servanthood because unless we see the position of servants in the kingdom of God, we'll not be too keen about being a servant. I've noticed a lot of times that usually when there's a service to do, when one comes to actual physical work or so forth, then there's not usually an overabundant supply of people who want to step up and serve. But I think if we understood what servanthood meant in the kingdom of God, there would be a total different attitude toward that. Jesus, in, in pardon me, the Gospel of John that we just read about, we read first of all about Jesus' first miracle. It mentions that it was the first of his works that were done when he changed the water into wine. But look at the circumstances around this particular story in the Bible. Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Jesus' mother was there as well. They were in, in Canaan, and I'm sure it was a, wasn't a huge town, but I'll bet there was quite a few people at this particular wedding, and Jesus was concerned even about an embarrassing moment for the bridegroom and the bride, where he was actually... <coughs> he was actually... One, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Hallelujah. Let's just stop and pray some more. I just sense that there's a place I want to go, but I sense something stirring in my spirit that's kind of holding me back. And we're here to hold, hear from the Holy Spirit, aren't we? Yeah. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your presence here today. We thank you for the power that comes with your presence we thank you, God, that you speak to your people. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Lord, I include that, myself in that, Lord. Give me ears to hear, God, what you're saying, that you might release your word today to these people in the name of Jesus. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Just tell him what you think of him right now. Just take a, a moment and just worship him. Think you're wonderful, Lord. You're awesome. 
God, you're magnificent. We praise you for your kindness. We worship you, Lord Jesus, the one who is and who was and who is to come. We thank you for your grace. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to us. And thank you, Jesus, for requesting the Father that he would send us Holy Spirit. We thank you so much that he's here right now. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. When I was reading this a little bit earlier, and I, I kind of get tripped up a little bit in, in the reading, <laughs> I was reading it in, the, in, in verse 4 where Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? That kind of saying doesn't go over too well when you're talking to a woman a lot of times, especially your spouse. Woman, what are you talking about? What does that have to do with me? Yet Jesus seemed to speak that to her. Now, I want you to notice something. What I want you to notice, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this that I spent on last week concerning servanthood, but I want you to notice that Jesus was about to do a miracle and Mary said to the servants, I notice she said to the servants, the servants are going to be a part of this miracle. It is the servants that Mary said to uh, Whatever he says to you, do it. It's not the disciples. Didn't, she didn't go to the disciples. The disciples were there as well. They were invited to the wedding, but she didn't speak to the disciples about the disciples. She told the servants, now listen carefully to Jesus, and whatever, whatever he says to you, you do it. And when there, we read about the fact that there were six water pots of stone. Uh, I, I believe in, in, for the sake of where we're going this morning, I want us to think about yourself as one of those water pots. Those water pots of stone, in fact, in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 25, it speaks to us as, about us as being living stones. You and I are actually living stones. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. You are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And so we are, I want us to see ourselves as those stone jars that were filled up with water and transformed into wine. Wine speaks to us about something that makes glad the heart of man, the Bible says. But it also speaks about, to us about the transformation process because uh, grapes go through a transformation process and wine is, is produced. There's a real transformation that takes place. And we, you and I, are to be a people who are actually poured out to the world to release to them an element of joy and also an element of transformation. You and I are, to, are called by God to serve the, our, our generation in that, in that particular area, to be poured out to bring wholeness to a lost and dying world around us. And these, the, the servants that were in this particular area here were people who were a part of the first miracle that is recorded in the book of John that Jesus did. And if you want to be a part of the miraculous of God, anybody here want to be a part of the miraculous of God? I believe there's quite a number who want to be here of a, a part of the miraculous aspects of God, then we're going to have to learn to be a servant. It was the servants here who got the to be involved in the miracle. They actually got to administer the first miracle that Jesus did. They actually began to, to serve, and they were the only ones at first that even recognized there was a miracle that took place. It was a servant who stepped out. And now, the Bible says that Jesus came not to serve, but to be served. That should give us an indication of how you and I are supposed to live our lives as Christians because we are supposed to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he didn't come to be served but to serve. Uh, the, Jesus also, we went through this last week, when Jesus was on the earth, when he was before Pilate, and Jesus was speaking to Pilate, and he said to him, My kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate said to him, then you are a king then. And Jesus said, you say right that I am a king. Now I want us to notice this. Jesus was a king while he walked upon the earth. He wasn't, he's just not going to be a king someday. 
He was a king when he walked upon the earth. He was born as a king into this world. And we know about the wise men came to bring uh, the, uh, the gifts to the king. When he was about two years old, they came and, and gave gifts to Jesus. And they weren't give, coming to give gifts to necessarily to a baby. They were coming to give gifts to a king. Jesus was a king, but yet he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. In the kingdom of God, to be a king in the kingdom of God is to serve. Jesus is the greatest example for us of being a king in the kingdom of God. You know, we are called to reign with Christ. We know that from Scripture. We are called to reign with Christ, but many times we think of reigning in this world's terms. We think of being a king in this world's terms, meaning that we have lots of servants all around us, and they just uh, go and do everything that we desire to do. But that's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to be great, you must be the least among you. You must be willing to serve. In the kingdom of God, to be a king means you must be willing and able to serve. And I believe all of us can serve in some way, shape, or form. It's important to get that aspect down because many times we think about, come to Christ, he will do everything for you, he's washed away your sin, come to Christ and you'll live victoriously throughout these ages. And there's an element of truth to that, of course, but there's also this element of servanthood that is looked over many, many times. We have to ask ourselves, if we're believers, if we want to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have to ask ourselves, who am I serving? Who am I serving this day? And I, and I believe, really, we kind of have three choices. We can serve the devil, which none of us wants to do, I mean, that's what we've been taken out of. We've been delivered out of darkness and brought into to light. We could serve him, but no, we, uh, we can also serve ourselves. And ourselves is not too far from serving the devil when we go our own way. Or we can choose to serve God. Now, how do you serve God in this natural realm? Well, I believe it's the same way you love God. I remember one time, I can still remember. You ever remember times when God speaks to you, a particular time you were doing something and God spoke to you? Uh, I remember there's different times in my life when I think of these things, I know exactly where I was. It just, it seems like it, it had an impression on you, so it left, uh, it left an impression on you. I remember I was driving into Cornwall, uh, and I was, I was driving down to the lights, and I was saying to the Lord, I was saying, God, I, I love you. I love you, Lord. I think you're wonderful. I really love you. And he, I, I felt he spoke back to me just really quickly. He said, if you love me, love my people. Love me if you love my people. And I believe that you and I, if we say that we want to serve God, we want to be servants of the Lord, the way we do that is by serving his people, by serving one another, by recognizing, by honoring one another, by honoring one another. Service to the Lord inv involves service to one another. Service to the Lord means that we are taking on his characteristics so that we can be like him. We must realize that to be a servant means to be one who is like Christ. To be one, we are actually demonstrating Christ's likeness when we are serving one another. Jesus said in John 13, 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. He began to serve the disciples. When he was about to go through his greatest trial, he served his disciples. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, and was going to God. Jesus, after, because he knew this, he was willing to submit himself to washing the disciples' feet. 
you will only be able to serve God to the extent that he desires you to serve God is when you know your position in Christ, when you know the Father. Jesus said, basically saying, I know the Father, I know that he has sent me, I know where I'm going, I know my place in God, and because I am so secure, so secure in my Father, I'm not ashamed, it, I don't take it as a belittling thing to do to get down on my knees and wash my disciples' feet. You see, when we don't have a good context of our Heavenly Father, we don't realize that He loves us, He cares about us, He's our security, He's the one that we're looking to honor. When we get to that place, then we are willing to do anything for Him. We are willing to humble ourselves because we are so secure in God. We are willing to be ridiculed because we are so secure in God. Because I know my God and my God knows me. That means I am secure in him. And I don't need to get my security from somebody else. I don't need to get uh, patted on the back all the time because, uh, you know, of what I do. I don't need to be looking for man's approval when I have God's approval. And when I have God's approval, I'm willing to do anything that I think would be uh, something that he would want me to do. And we know that he wants us to serve his people. If we will know the Father, if we will have a good image of the Father, then we will understand our position, the high position that he gives us when he moves us into service, when he moves us into service. There's a scripture in the Bible, in the book of John, where it says that the, some of the Pharisees believed in the Lord, but they wouldn't declare it because they loved the praises of, of men more than the praise of God. That's a sad position to be in, isn't it? They love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God, the honor of God. And so they kept quiet. The Pharisees were unwilling to speak forward because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Many of us need to be groomed into this position of service. Many of us need to be, uh, a lot of times in the, in the natural kingdom, if we're not groomed in the kingship, we'll make a mess of it. We talked about this last week, about the, uh, the King Saul, when he was anointed to be king, the fact that he was anointed of God, God told prophet Samuel to anoint uh, Saul as king, and Saul became king. And it seemed like he started off uh, fairly good at the beginning, but then he totally missed it. But he was never groomed to be a king. Although he was anointed to be king, he was not groomed to be king, and he missed it. He got jealous. He became an angry man and actually became demon-possessed uh, before he died. And he began to persecute the one that, they, that God had sent to protect him. And David also was anointed of God. David was a, a man of God. He was anointed of God. And he didn't become a king until many years after he was anointed of God to be a king, but he was groomed to be a king. Through 10 years of persecution by Saul, Saul sought to kill him. He, he, he tried to track him down many, many times. Uh, David was betrayed many times. He was groomed through all these things before he actually became a king. And when he stepped into his kingship, he was ready. He began to serve God, and he began to serve God by serving God's people. He was groomed into it. We ask sometimes for a great anointing. Sometimes we think, Lord, you're going to, you know, if you want me to serve in this area, you're going to have to anoint me. Yes, he may have to anoint you, but you're going to have to be groomed into it. You're going to have to begin doing the little things before you step into something great. T.D. Jakes who is, you know, I, I think his, his congregation now is about probably 40,000 just in this church that, that he ministers to. And when he started out, the first seven years of his, of his work in the church was basically, uh, he said he was given, I think, one or two chances to preach in seven years and the rest of the time that he was to look around and clean up anything that the church needed to be... To, to have cleaned up. He was to be the one who was to look at the parking lot, meet the greet people, greet the people in the parking lot and so forth. And he never was really, he, he was being groomed for something greater. He was being groomed 
for something larger than what he was at that given t- at any given time. He had to give himself the service. I remember uh, David Alsobrook, who was, uh, we have had him in years ago and did some preaching for us, but he told a story about when he started out. I believe he started out in the Nazarene church, and when uh, he came to church, he was excited. He was a young man. He was excited to be involved in church, and he thought surely he could do something like uh, being in some kind of ministry. So he went to the pastor and said, what can I do for you? He said, well, actually, we have nobody to look after the washrooms. We have nobody to, uh, to make sure the washrooms are clean. And we have nobody to clean up the pews and so forth. Would you be willing to do that? Well, he certainly didn't, wasn't willing at the time, but it, God had to get a hold of him to get his heart straight before God, and he decided, I'm going to see that those are the cleanest wash, church washrooms that, in this state. And he, and he said, I remember uh, being under the pew, taking some gum off the pews uh, that were put there by people who shouldn't put gum in the pews. <laughs> but they were, and he said, he, said he, he remembered taking gum off the off the pews and thinking, Lord, is this what you've called me to? Is this what you called me? If it is God, if it's what you called you, I'll do the best I can. I'll, do the, I'll give it the best I've got. And he began to, to do that, actually. And then the first thing you know, he was invited to go to a, a ministry uh, in the prison. And God began to use him uh, with the word of God and, and delivering people and so forth. But you have to be willing to start out somewhere in service so God can mold you and shape you into what he wants you to be so that you'll be useful in the master's hand. Now, we know that Acts 13, 36, the Bible says that David served his generation and then he went to sleep. David served his generation. and even He was king all right. But anybody in high authority, anybody who has been giving a, given a lot of authority and, and walked through a, a grooming process knows the responsibility of service, and they begin to serve before God. And by the way, you can't serve somebody when you're all alone, when you don't get involved, when you're an outsider and looking in. You have to get in, get it hooked up, find out where there's needs, and begin providing that need. Doing what again? Glory to God. How many, how many amens did I hear? <laughs> now, in any kingdom, I'm just laying that foundation down because I believe that we've many times given the impression that to be a Christian, be involved in the kingdom of God, means that everything's rosy and everything is, is supposed to come our way. But I've noticed something. When you serve people, you end up doing things that you don't like to do, you don't feel called to do, you don't feel you have an anointing to do. But you do it anyway. You do it anyway. If you're going to be a servant in the kingdom, you do it anyway. Now, there are laws in the kingdom of God. There are laws in this land that we live in. There are laws in the kingdom of God. One of the laws of the kingdom of God is, if you want to be somebody great, learn how to serve. If you're going to reign, learn how to serve. That's a law. That's a principle of the kingdom of God. Serve, serve, serve. Now, there are other laws in the kingdom of God. There are other laws, or we could call them truths. And I don't... I don't think we've ever lived in a day where it was so difficult to discern the truth. I believe there's a major battle going on for truth today in the spiritual realm. The enemy is doing everything he can to try to dislodge people of the truth away from the truth. The enemy is doing everything he can to try to get us thinking a way that would be contrary to the, some of the things that Jesus had told us, to, uh, has spoken to us about, and about the laws of the kingdom of, of, the, of the laws of the kingdom of God. I believe we're living in a day today where there are spiritual forces at work uh, manipulating things in order for get, to get you to believe a lie. You remember the Bible talks about in the last days at the last time the enemy will go forth and he will go forth trying to get people to believe a lie and the Bible says that if it possible even the elect would fall for the lie. You see truth today 
is, or let me put it another way, there's a battleground that we're facing for truth. There are so many things that are happening around us today that is fake news. That's one of the things that we hear all the time, that there are, there are whole companies set up to uh, disseminate fake news. Get, why? Why, why, why are there people, if you look on the internet and look fake news and look at the number of uh, websites that talk about fake, fake news and, and they're, they're putting out fake news, and you know the reason why they're doing it? It's because the advertisers that they get from their, from their websites are, bringing, are paying them a lot of money. There is an appetite for people to be fed something that, makes them feel good rather than understand the truth. Tremendous appetite out there. And the enemy is taking advantage of it. There are so many ways that we we can be deceived today. You want to put that picture up there, Jordan? Uh, There's so many ways that we can be deceived today. Uh, In this particular photo, this looks pretty interesting here where all eyes are on Putin. Looks like Putin's the man here. He's got the word. But that in, in that photo... Putin isn't even in it. He's just been planted in there. But it's, it's made up, it's doctored to, to make people believe that Putin is the one who's getting all the attention. That's just one example of what can happen with fake news today. And it's, it's also happening around, uh, well, more digitally now than, than ever where they can actually, they're, they're getting to the point now where they could ha- show a video of someone standing up and saying some things that are totally contrary to what he said. Fake news. There's, there's, there's two areas of danger in that particular way. It means that I could stand up here and with the proper tools that people could work with, they could actually have me saying some things that I never said, saying some things that I agree with that I don't agree with. That's one side of the danger of it. The other side of the danger is a person could stand up here and say some things and then deny that he's ever said it. Because we know these things, these technologies are out there today. Truth, the battle is over truth today. And you and I are, are living in this world where what's true and what's not. The Word of God has never been so important throughout history as it is today. Because it's only the Word of God that is going to allow us to be able to understand the truth that God has for you and I and how God wants us to live. The truth is crucial. The Word of God is so important today that we cannot afford to go a day without getting into the Word, reading some of the Word, getting into our spirit, and receiving life from the Word because when we take our time to read the Word, we are actually receiving revelation that will help us to keep our minds thinking straight in the midst of all this array of darkness that has been spewed upon the church. We must get into the Word of God. We must get into the Word of God. It is going to take some diligent effort to pay attention to the Word. Because I believe from here all in, folks, it's not all roses. Now, I'm speaking to you, uh, 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 really, a positive message because I want to prepare us. This, I don't want a, bunch, a church, I don't want to be the pastor of a church when I get to heaven and the Lord will say, how come you never told them what I needed them to hear? How come you only told them that if you believe my word that prosperity will come and this and that and healing is yours and all the rest of it and make them feel good? I don't want to stand before God and say, well, thank you for the bunch of pansies that you raised up. I have no interest in that. I want to I wanna raise the people up who are willing to stand up for truth, to speak the truth in this age that we live in. Jordan Peterson, uh, Professor Jordan Peterson said this. He said, speak the truth or at least don't lie. That's an interesting statement. Speak the truth or at least don't lie. But it's not good enough for a Christian to speak the truth. It's not good enough for a Christian, I should say, to just not lie. That is not good enough. Because many times 
the Christian church comes into the place where they say, I I don't really want to speak the truth, but at least I won't lie. Well, that tells me that the church is becoming dumb. If that's the attitude that we have, then the church is becoming dumb. And what I mean by dumb is that the church has lost its voice. I don't mean stupid. I mean the, the church has lost its voice. If the church becomes dumb so they won't lie, then they've lost their voice. And then if, if you don't have any voice, then you are actually irrelevant. And as a church, we don't want to be irrelevant. We want to have the word of the Lord. Jesus, Jesus said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we are here to declare the truth to a lost and dying world. But if we just don't lie, then we end up losing our voice. We lose any prophetic edge that we have. And this lost world needs a prophetic edge. They need to hear the truth. Joel was telling me, on Canada Day, they had some people into the, the tent where they set up a, a sign where it said spiritual reading. And people would come into that, and spiritual reading, when they get in there, they find out it's Christian. And Joe was telling me that some people would come in, and he would find out that they were Christian. And he said, they, they would say, I thought this was some kind of spiritual reading. I didn't realize what was Christian. Joe said, thinking in his head, then what are you doing here? What are you doing here? If you think this is some kind of psychic, what are you doing in a place, if you're a Christian, if you've called on Jesus Christ, what are you doing coming to some kind of psychic? You see, the Christians have this idea that anything goes many times. They don't take a standard. Somehow, some way, it seems like the church has gotten this idea that there's no standards in the kingdom of God. That it's just whatever feels good, do it. It seems like they forgot the word. The, the things that the Apostle Paul said, Galatians 5.19 is a good example. And yet, I don't know how some th- people say some of the things that they say. But the only thing I can think of is that they must not read the Bible. Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. I talked about it last week. I spelled that out very clearly because I think the church has missed it here. Fornication means sexual activity outside the covenant agreement that God has ordained. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you can go and get together with somebody else and say, well, I love this person so much and I know God understands. God doesn't understand. And God doesn't understand the church that accepts that kind of thing. It's very clear in the scriptures. We've got to get back to truth. The devil is saying, still saying today, you will not surely die. You will not surely get messed up. You will not surely get messed up and get dysfunctional and even oppressed and depressed if you disobey the word of God. The works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Outbursts of anger. Well, that's that's one of the holy ones, Pastor Bill. It's okay for a Christian to get angry. Well, some people must think that because I hear sometimes of how angry people get. They get stirred up about something and they get angry. They get ripped off. Somebody ripped them off, and they get angry. There's an anger that comes upon them. Rather than deal with that, I'm not saying that I never get angry, but I'm telling you that when I do get angry, the next breath is, Lord, where did that come from? Lord, what is it on the inside of me that caused that to rise up? I didn't know that was on the inside of me. And when that happens, we get an opportunity to deal with it. But we can't just go through life and have some of these these things happen and say, oh, well, that's just me. That's just my makeup. No. The Bible says that that's a work of the flesh. Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy. Do you ever envy people? They've got an awesome, beautiful home, and you've got 
so-so? I'll tell you how to recognize sometimes whether you're envious of somebody or not. Somebody invites you into their home. You've never been in their home, and maybe it's a brand new home. And you know the person who has uh, just uh, built a new home and just, or maybe bought a new home, they enjoy it, it's special to them, and you invite somebody in, and they come in, and, say, and they say, oh, this is your new home, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they change the subject totally. They can't enter into your joy because they're envious. They can't enter into your joy. It's not wrong. If you, you, know, you get a nice, beautiful home, you're joyful. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. I mean, God wants to enjoy good things, but we ought to be able to be joyful when somebody else gets even more than what we've got. We should be happy for them. We should be glad with them. We should rejoice with them rather than be envious. Murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Everybody say, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul already told him this before. He mentioned to him again. He seems that he's had to speak about it over and over again. And I'm convinced there's just not enough of that kind of preaching. Today there's not enough men of God and women of God who stand up and declare the truth of the Word of God the way it needs to be. And because of that, the church has become soft. Amen. I believe that we need to have the Word spoken, whether it sounds good to our ears or not, whether it tickles our ears or not. We need to make sure that we're hearing truth. I thank God for, for some of the preachers out there that are really great. Joyce Myers is one of them. She'll tell it straight. She won't beat around the bush at all. And I, I really appreciate that. And, but I see sometimes in the congregation, in the large meetings that she has, some of the, some of the people, and they're, they're clapping and they're going forth and so forth. I wonder when was the last time they ever heard that. You see, there is a battle for truth today. And I want to be on the side of truth. Speaking forth the word of God, the word of life, because that's what it is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I mean, even Pilate was messed up. He said, what is truth? When Jesus talked, started talking about truth, what is truth? He didn't know what it was even back then. He'd been a bad case if he was alive today and seen the technology that's available to, you know, to skew truth so much. There's another word that we use, untruth. He told an untruth. Well, to me, an untruth is a lie. Man, we come up with some crazy words to make, it, to make sin sound like something that it isn't. To make sa sin sound acceptable, we come up with these words. But I believe it, it's going to be told straight to us when we stand before God. We're not going to be able to use some of this language when we, come, when we stand before the Lord. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living. That means it's alive. The word of God is living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why we need the word of God. We need the word of God to pierce us. We need the word of God to discern the intents and the thoughts of our own hearts because many times we don't even realize our own hearts. Jeremiah says, man's heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can know it or we can actually begin to understand our hearts when we take the Word of God and wash ourselves with the Word of God over and over again, that the Word of God might grant us revelation into truth, what is true and what is not. Because everything around us affects us. It influences us in a powerful way. Everything, the music that you listen to, influence you. The words that you hear, they influence you. The things that you read, they influence you more than you know. There was a group of students, university students, and this test was done over many, many times. They were giving, given a test, a true and false test, and there was no real value in the test itself, 
but on one of the tests, they added a lot of words about aging. It might have been, the old man said this, and, or there was, there was a lot of words in there about aging and old people. The other group did not have any of those words in it at all. It was the same test, only those words were taken out. And they were, the, the exams were passed in, and they monitored the the, the students as they walked to the elevator and over and over again as they did this test the people who got the, the words uh, the test with the words about aging in it walked slower to the elevator that's amazing to me it really is it's amazing over, it just wasn't done one time it was done over and over again and I, I, when I read something like that I think how much things influence us. The things around us influence us that we don't realize. The shows that we watch, the amount of news that we watch, the amount of fake news that we listen to, the amount of Facebook that we pay attention to, how that influences us. And if there's ever anything that is a lot of untruth, it's, face, it's on Facebook. It's everywhere on there. And we bombard it. And we're careful to show just how good we look when we're picture is taken at just the right time so we can show our best. That's fake news. That's not life. That's not life. It's fake news. I did a wedding yesterday and the Elizabeth Wall, many of you know her, she came in, and then there was two young ushers, 15 and 16, and she came, I was standing close to them, and she came up to them and said, oh, what handsome, what wonderful, handsome young men. And then she turned to me and said, good to see you. <laughs> she wasn't going to be fake about it. No, there's a lot of fake news out there today, and listen, folks, we are the people whom the next generation are looking at. And if we will not tell the truth, the next generation are going to adhere to less and less and less of the truth. We must speak up. Yes, we'll be criticized. Yes, we might lose some of our, what we would think, our self-respect. Well, we won't leave lose self-respect in our own eyes, but we might lose it in somebody else's eyes. Yes, there might be difficulties ahead because we choose to stand for the truth and we might be uh, shunned in some circles, but you'll remain uh, with a person of great integrity before God. And what's more important? I pray that you are more concerned. You're not like the Pharisees and be more concerned about what man thinks about you than what God thinks about you. I pray that you're a people who will stand for the word of God, stand up and be counted in whatever situation you're in. At least you may not know how to put it, to be really articulate in some discussions that you're involved in, but at least you can stand up and say, look, I know what I'm hearing right now, but I just want you to know I don't agree. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with what's taken place. I don't agree with it. People come up with all kinds of stupid ideas of how to get away from telling the truth. I read where one pastor put on Facebook, how come, you know, uh, it seems like Jesus talked about the uh, rich people uh, and the, he, putting it in a negative connotation, talked about rich people a lot more than he, he did about uh, homosexuals. So maybe we should talk more about the negative of being rich. I think, well, that's one of the stupidest statements I ever heard. I don't mind saying it either. I, I'm telling you, just because Jesus never spent a lot of time talking about homosexuality, that doesn't mean that he approved of it. He didn't spend much time talking about pedophiles either, either but I'm sure none of us would agree with that. Oh, God, help us. Help us, Lord. I feel like I talked myself into something I don't know how to get out of. <laughs> Stand up with me, please. Hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your holy written and anointed word, Father. Thank you, God, that your word gives us life 
Your word releases life to us, Father. We thank you, Father. Make us bold, God, in order to speak your word with all boldness, Father. Send us forth with boldness, God. And we ask, dear God, that you stretch forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders would take place in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We ask you, Father, to move upon us, God, and, and help us to put ourselves in a place where we will be bold, we will speak your word, and that you will confirm your word as is spoken in the name of Jesus Christ right now. We praise you for it. We worship you. We worship you now, Jesus. Lloyd, I believe that, I believe you're going to sing Glorious Day, is it? Are you going to sing that one? Yeah, we did. You have it? Yeah, sing that song. I just feel that it's appropriate. Because when you come out from a lie into the truth, you've actually come out up out of the grave you've actually come out of the grave of deceit when you step out into truth now don't think that you can just gather all the truth by simply reading the bible ask holy spirit to cause the word to come alive to you because it's the holy spirit's life injected into the word that will actually bring revelation to us so that we can hear and understand what it's saying but when you come out of deception into truth you are actually coming out of death into life up out of the grave into life let's sing about that before we go this morning amen have you run out of that grave up and out of that grave into truth Jesus said, I've come to declare the truth of the Father. And we have come to do the same thing. We have been birthed into the kingdom to do the same thing, to make the truth known to the children of the world. And there is going to come a day, there is going to come a day when the word of God goes forth that will be a hammer against the lies of the enemy. And the hammer will strike with healing, with deliverance, with wholeness, with setting people out, out of the prison. The hammer will go forth in order to validate the word of the Lord. For the word of the Lord will be preached over the earth and the things that the enemy has attempted to use to destroy the word will actually be destroyed itself. For the word of the Lord is more powerful than anything that the enemy could ever throw against you. Don't listen to the lie that my children are straying and can never make heaven. Don't listen to the lie that my body is sick now and has to break down. Don't listen to the lie that your time is finished here on earth before the word of the Lord comes to your spirit and says it's enough, you can come home now. Realize that the enemy will attempt to deceive you into walking according to his purposes. But I declare that my way is better, says the Lord. I will work in you, you will work in me, and together we will see a rising of my church to the place where they will call the shots in this world. For though the enemy has been working upon those who will yield to him, my church, hear my voice, they know me, they follow me, and they'll do my purposes, says the Lord. So be encouraged today, take my word, run with it, I will back you up. I will see that your, the word that is spoken will prevail in your circumstance, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah.